Well, a warm welcome to this talk. Now, I've been reading some social media reports that seem quite alarming about a new sinister virus coming out of China. Now, there is a risk of a new sinister virus coming out of China, but it's not there at the moment as far as we know. So am I worried about an imminent new pandemic virus coming out of China at the moment, given all the information we have? No, absolutely, I'm not worried about that. Now, what they're talking about is this human meta pneumonia virus. So I want to look at that a little bit now. It turns out it's new in people's minds and consciousness, but not actually that new. It's probably been around for at least 60 years, but we'll look at that. Uh, it, we'll look at that as we go through. It's the virus I think I've probably just uh, in the process of recovering from, so I'm taking a special interest in it. And I must say, before I started to look at this, I wasn't that familiar with it myself. I'd heard of it, but I didn't know any any details about it. So let's look at it now. First thing to realize, it's just one of the respiratory viruses. So rhinoviruses tend to affect the nose. COVID, of course, we know. Um, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, is another respiratory virus. And of course, influenza is another respiratory virus. For most people, for most adults, influenza is probably the one that's going to make them sickest out of those at the moment, although that will depend on individuals and their circumstances and their level of immunity. But of course, what is good for immunity from one, as we've talked about in the previous video, is good for immunity from all of these viruses. But let's look at this now, really quite interesting. So it's human uh, metanumonio virus. Now, this was first identified in uh, 2001. I think yesterday or the day before I said 2021, I just simply got that wrong. Um, it's 202001. Now, in the Netherlands, uh, the paediatricians realized that some children were getting a viral infection that wasn't quite typical. It wasn't quite RSV. It wasn't quite influenza. Um, what, quite what it was, they weren't sure. So they did PCR analysis and they found this new virus called the human uh, metanumonio virus. And it turns out it was very similar to a virus that had been discovered in birds back in the 1970s. So this is uh, probably the, the, the human version and the bird version are different. So it probably went from birds to humans at one stage, perhaps way back in the 50s or even 40s or even the 30s, 1930s, who knows. Um, it went, it jumped at one stage and then it's mutated in humans after that. It doesn't seem that birds are still a reservoir for the virus. It seems to have been a single species jump followed by uh, mutations in, in humans. Because there's some serological evidence that the virus has been widespread since, since at least 1958. So uh, people discovered this in 2001. Uh, they discovered it in birds in the 1970s. But then when they look back at preserved human blood specimens from way back, they found it going back to 1958. The antibodies to the uh, meta, the human metanumonio virus were found way back. So it's not new. This is the key thing about this. It's not new. And because it's not new, that means we'll have good levels of immunity to it. But let, let's go through that uh, systematically without uh, jumping onto the next stage. Um, so um, a very similar uh, metanumonia virus was already known in birds, so it's probably a zoonotic, uh, probably a, new, a, a zoonotic uh, spread. Estimated incubation period is three to six days. Spread mostly close contact air and objects. So the spread, it, it's close contact, it's through the air. We're more likely to get it in wintertime because people go indoors, people's vitamin D levels drop. And I think they're the main reasons that these vi winter viruses spread. It's the vitamin D levels drop because people aren't exposed to the sun and don't take supplements. And also because they're indoors and close to each other, the proximity effects. So any virus that is there is more likely to spread. Otherwise, it's hard to see why viruses should be particularly more common in winter, really. I mean, you, uh, you get some uh, closing down of the, uh, the nasal uh, vasculature, so that probably means viruses can get into the nose more readily. Um, but the main factors are probably the vitamin D and the close proximity indoors that people do in the colder weather. 
Um, now, in the United States, human metanumonia virus is associated with 20,000 under fives hospitalizations per year. So as we say, this is a well-known cause. Now, the reason that it's more likely to hospitalize children is everyone gets exposed to this, probably pretty well. Well, we believe everyone gets exposed to this virus. It's ubiquitous. It's endemic. Uh, but children haven't been exposed before. They're the, therefore, they don't have any of their own natural immunity. Therefore, the, they're the ones that are most likely to get sick. Of course, the vast majority of children that get this infection don't get ill enough to be hospitalized. For most of them, it's a routine uh, viral infection. Peak age of hospitalization is uh, six months to 12 months, which is a little younger, a little older, sorry, than RSV, where the peak age of hospitalization is two to three months. Now, the infection can also progress to the lower respiratory tract, causing bronchiolitis and pneumonia. Bronchiolitis is infection of the, the bronchioles, the very small microscopic airways. And of course, uh, pneumonia is infection of the lung tissue where the uh, infl inflammatory fluids will collect in the alveoli themselves. So this does have the potential to spread down the way, causing a severe infection. These are the ones that would need hospitalized. But for the vast majority... Um, it's a relatively, mi relatively minor, <laughs> relatively minor, because I've been pretty rough with mine, but relatively minor um, for, uh, for most people, thankfully. Now, uh, incident in China is not greatly increased. So um, China reported overwhelming hospitals in the northern provinces in, the co in, in wintertime. So there's been reports of hospitals being overwhelmed in the north of China. But in actual fact, it turns out that they don't have more cases of respiratory illness in China than normal. It's just that this is the time of year where they get it. It's very cold in northern China now. So this is the time of year when they'll get it. So what we're actually looking at is, is what, if you like, a routine. So incidence in China is not greatly re raised. Now, this is from China. Um, uh, this is outpatient visits from China CDC. And what we see here in yellow is uh, the 2002, 2000, and, uh, sorry, 2022, 2022-2023 year. In, per, in uh, purple, that's the 23-24. And what we see so far is the year for 2024-2025. Uh, so we're looking at a fairly normal tra trajectory in terms of OPD visits in China with respiratory viruses. Nothing alarming there at all. These are hospital visits, and again, we see in red uh, where we're up to at the moment. Previous years, 2022, 2023 was a bad year, these yellow peaks. So we see that um, although the numbers of hospitalizations are high in China at the moment with respiratory viruses, we're not seeing anything out of the way. So basically, we're getting a normal winter virus season in the United Kingdom, Slightly more than normal, perhaps, but still basically a normal season. And in China, a normal season for what we would expect, as evidenced by the information from the Chinese uh, Centers for Disease uh, Control. So pandemic potential of this, I think basically we can say virtually none. This is an endemic disease. We have it here already. It's not a new disease that's going to spread from China. It's just a routine endemic virus that's been around for decades perhaps many decades but we know of at least uh, for at least two decades that we know of for sure so the pandemic potential i don't really think it's an issue there now serological studies show by the age of five uh, pretty well all the uh, world's children are, are exposed so by the age of five if you look for the antibodies we find that children throughout the world have all been exposed this is an endemic virus. Therefore, when we get it later, um, hopefully we've got high degrees of protection. And for most people, it might just present as a common cold. Some people like me, who's maybe immunity to this virus has waned a little bit, can get a fever for, for a few days. Um, but for most people, uh, it's become a routine infection because we already have immunity to it. Isn't the natural immune system wonderful? We didn't bother making a vaccine to this. We just rely on, <coughs> on our natural <coughs> immune response, which is absolutely brilliant. And of course, from 1950s, when this virus was almost certainly around, up until uh, 2001, when we didn't know it, it, it affected humans. <laughs> you know, we just, we just got on with it. So um, pretty um, ubiquitous, I think. Reinfections are common. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> in, in adults and over in, in older children. So reinfections, yes. 
Slight mutations in the virus, reinfections can occur as, as we would expect. Now, um, risk groups here, the very young, premature babies are particularly at risk, the old, the immunocompromised, people with comorbidities, particularly at risk of people with asthma and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And outbreaks also occur in care facilities for the old and the young. So as we would expect, people in institutionalised situations more at risk, comorbidities more at risk, particularly people with asthma and COPD are more at risk of getting the lower respiratory tract, more severe disease. So there we go. Um, routine. This is what we've had for decades now. Nothing particularly new. Optimise the immune system. We've had no vaccines for decades on, for this. So optimise the immune system would seem to be making sense to me. But we still have this so-called crisis in the UK. Um, it's, it's always the same every winter. Um, th this is from the King's Fund. With depressing predictability, health services are in the depths of the annual NHS winter crisis. There are already reports of patients waiting more than two days to be seen in A&E and long ambulance handover delays. And critical incidences have been declared at hospitals. Uh, well, I've lost my place now. Uh, crit critical incidences have been declared at hospitals up and down the country. The consequence is that patients are being cared for in unsuitable conditions, such as trolley beds, in hospitals, uh, um, hospital trolleys rather than hospital beds in corridors. Uh, was this predictable? Yes, 100% predictable. Okay, influenza is a little higher than normal, but you know, every few years it is. This was completely, utterly predictable. So, here's a few interesting thoughts from me. Are these winter episodes optional? Could we opt out of them? Well, I think the answer to that is yes, we could opt out of a lot of it. We could do research and instigate Professor Clancy's treatment of the non-typable Haemophilus influenzae. This is simply a tablet that you take with these bacteria in. They go into the gastrointestinal tract to the immunological tissue in the GI tract called the pears patches. The pears patches then send messages to the respiratory mucosa to activate respiratory mucosal immunity. And that will protect against not just non-typable Haemophilus influenzae, it will protect against all, all, antigens, like all bacteria, all viruses affecting the immune system, uh, affecting the respiratory system, because it will upgrade the natural respiratory mucosa. So we wouldn't need a vaccine for this, a vaccine for that, a vaccine for this, and a vaccine for something else. No, this would just upgrade the entire immune system. In my view, um, this is of such significance, it should be awarded a Nobel Prize for medicine. Uh, let's also look at another way this could be uh, prevented. We have the Microbacterium vacci. Now, this, is the, uh, this has been developed by uh, Professor Angus Dalglish that we've talked about from the work of others as well. And this Microbacterium uh, vacci, um, it's, it's actually uh, based on a bacterium that comes from a cow. It's attenuated in a particular way by the, the company Imodulin, which is probably going into administration, unfortunately. And it's given as an intradermal injection. Now, uh, Professor Dalglish has found that this reduces recurrence of cancers, cer certain cancers at least. He studied uh, melanoma, um, pretty sure he studied uh, bowel cancer, pancreatic cancer, and colleagues have reported efficacy in bowel cancer as well because it upgrades the whole natural immune system systemically. So Professor Clancy's non-typable Haemophilus influenzae oral tablet would upgrade the respiratory mucosa Although other tablets could, uh, other preparations could be made that upgrades other mucosa, such as genital mucosa um, or uh, gastrointestinal mucosa, potentially. Um, but but the, the preparation has got upgrades respiratory mucosa, whereas the preparation that Professor Dalglish has been using uh, upgrades the entire innate immune system and will protect us against a whole range of organisms, viruses and bacteria. And the patients that he's got on for melanoma are, the, are on this treatment have reported they don't get any coughs and colds anymore. 
It's protecting them by upgrading their immune system. So we have the potential to massively upgrade the mucosal immune system with Professor Clancy's um, um, non-typable Haemophilus influenzae, to massively upgrade the systemic innate immune system with uh, Professor Dalgleish's um, um, mycobacterium vacai uh, preparation. Uh, uh, there's no money in that, of course, so no one bothers. Now, in my view, um, it would be quite reasonable to give this a Nobel Prize as well, so <coughs> because these are kind of working in similar ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're both upgrading the natural immune system. Uh, I, I think a, a joint Nobel Prize would be most appropriate uh, for these two gentlemen who were both uh, interviewed, who are basically two of the world's leading professors of medicine. This is not me talking to some guy down the pub. These are the world's leading medical researchers who've been uh, poo-pooed for their brilliant ideas. So if you've got any brilliant ideas, probably best keep them to the set yourself because people will attack you for it and poo-poo it, and you'll, you'll be attacked personally if you come up with ideas that could save millions of lives. Come up with an idea that saves money? Oh, you'll be welcome with open arms, my son. That's a completely different thing. This is the situation we are in. Great benefits that are noblizable, not being realised. I have not had access to either of these treatments. If I had... I would certainly have taken them as I'm convinced they are, oh, what words could we use? Safe and effective, perhaps. Also, obviously, 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 we need to make everyone vitamin D replete. Um, we talked about this in the last video. Uh, at the moment, NICE is nice in, in my country. This is the National Institute for Health and Care. Excellent. Excellent. It's actually recommending against screening. No routine vitamin D testing unless patient presents with any of the following. And basically, it's a few, couple of rare diseases or, or a rickets type thing with a, yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, I mean, why on earth wouldn't you want to treat vitamin deficiencies? But our government, through the National Institute for Health and Care of Excellence, is saying, no, don't test for these things. Um, we don't want to know. Um, we don't believe, it's almost as if they're saying we don't believe there's any value in, in optimising the levels of vitamin D in the blood, whereas we've given overwhelming evidence for the efficacy of that. But they're actually advising against, actually advising against, actually advising against GPs testing to titrate vitamin D levels in their patients. Unless they've got a few of these rare uh, diseases. Quite incredible. And that's without even talking about medicines that uh, are potentially, potentially antiviral. So there you go. Uh, we've got what we opted for. Let's hope that, um, you know, eight days time, seven or eight days time, there's going to be a new administration in the United States. I'm really hopeful that information that could transform world health or get into the public domain and into our hands, the hands of our brilliant doctors, scientists and data analysts. And I know quite a few of them are chomping at the bit waiting for this data. So another seven or eight days, let's see what happens. Um, but for now, we are where we're at. A situation I would describe as somewhat suboptimal. And of course, in England, we use understatement. Thank you for watching.